please join me in welcoming Dr. Mayuski, who's going to actually take care of his, of his presentation from the floor. So we've got. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day to listen to me, and I'll make sure that you'll get to lunch on time. If I don't, you can raise your hands. But most importantly, I would like to thank all of you for what you do. Uh, here in Maine and all over the world, we depend upon people like you, and, and you always come through. So thank you so much for what you do. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here speaking to you. Uh, I've listened to a couple of the, introductory, uh, the, the presentations earlier, and it's very clear that uh, everybody here obviously knows a great deal about climate change. Uh, you know a great deal about what goes on in Maine, the vulnerabilities in Maine. So the purpose of my presentation is not to tell you, I hope, things that you already know, but perhaps to put climate change in a much broader uh, scope and uh, allow us to think perhaps out of the box a little bit compared to the way we normally do. Some of the things that I'll talk about are so out of the box and in some ways are a little bit unnerving, uh, but I think if we all understand that there are many di different directions that climate can progress in the future and understand what the absolute extremes might be versus the, uh, the less terrifying extremes, it's important for us to have that in our in our toolkit when we go about planning and making decisions for the future. Uh, this whole concept of plausible scenario planning is one that is not necessarily used in the scientific world, but it's used by the military, it's used by business, and it's one uh, that, that uh, we advocate considerably in, in the Climate Change Institute. So I'll try to answer a few basic questions. Some of them sound very silly, uh, but I hope that by answering these questions it broadens our entire view of climate. What is climate? Why does climate change? How fast can climate change? How small a change is important? Uh, have humans impacted climate and how? What are the health impacts for humans and ecosystems? How is atmospheric circulation changing and why does that matter? We know that for ourselves right now firsthand. How might climate change in the future? How much could sea level rise? And then, what is climate change today in particular for a place like Maine? First question, what is climate change? I think a few years ago, most people would have said that climate change is nothing but temperature and how it will change over the future and perhaps over the last few years. Uh, but it's much more than that. It's the physical, meaning temperature, precipitation, atmospheric circulation, the chemical, the biological, and the social implications, components of climate change. It's obviously the weather integrated over days, weeks, months. You get to pick your own way of looking uh, at the climate. But the thing that's most important is that the weather has a re rather regular pattern. And then every now and then, there's some extreme events. And most often, it's those extreme events which give us the greatest amount of trouble. But it's also what the background trend is and whether or not we can determine which direction that trend will go in the future. And we in our institute, as do you, tend to think about the climate not just for a small area, but for a much larger area. And for our, our institute, we think about it at global scales, which may seem like overkill uh, if you try to apply it to Maine. But what I'll show you today, I hope, is that one of the reasons that we understand what the potential plausible scenarios will be for the future is we, because we've been looking all over the world at how the climate system operates and how it's forced. So in our institute, we take a slightly different approach uh, than other uh, research units of our type. We're one of the oldest in the world, uh, certainly one of the oldest multidisciplinary. We look at the instrumental record, the last roughly 100 years of recorded temperature, we look at the satellite record with immense detail that takes us back to probably the late 1970s. Uh, and our purpose is to make better predictions for the future. We do that by doing some of our own monitoring of how the climate operates, how lakes change in their acidity, changes in ocean temperature, uh, but we also do climate modeling, both on a global scale and down to the one kilometer by one kilometer scale 
Uh, but the other thing that we do is we go back in time. In some cases, we've gone back hundreds of thousands of years. Why would anybody bother to do that? Up until 20 years ago, it was considered to be nothing more than an academic exercise. But the reason that you want to do that is that in the last 100 years, you do not capture the full range of how, how much climate can change and how fast climate can change. If we only had the last 100 years of record, we would not be as well prepared as we are now. <clears throat> so why does climate change? Well, these cartoons give you all of the reasons why climate changes. I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, they come as a consequence of a very detailed year-by-year -year record that we recovered from Greenland that goes back 110,000 years. It's as if we managed to find a tree that was 110,000 years old, and then we looked at every single year and tried to understand how temperature, precipitation, etc. has changed. And what we found, as other people had before, but we were able to put it together for the first time, was that a large part of the climate system is dominated by these very long-term patterns created by where the Earth is with respect to the Sun, operating on tens of thousands of years. Next, a lot has to do with greenhouse gases, because these are the things which trap heat in the lower portion of the atmosphere. They can be absorbed by the ocean. They can be recycled through the Earth's system. And then thermohaline circulation. The ocean is capable of transporting heat throughout the planet. Uh, glaciers, ice dynamics, they grow and they get small. And as they grow and get small, they change the whiteness of the surface of the Earth the whiter the surface of the Earth, the more sea ice, the more energy you reflect. Changes in the energy output of the sun are very important, not just the solar cycle, but even on longer cycles. Changes in the amount of dust uh, in the atmosphere, which is produced by having large deserts, uh, in the case of humans, by agricultural practices, and then things like volcanoes. Well. That's the general story about how the climate, what, what controls climate. Next question is, how fast can climate change? And up until 1992, we all believed in the entire scientific community that the climate system operated very, very slowly. The, the graph on the bottom goes from zero to 120,000 years ago. And this is change in mean uh, global temperature going from today, relatively no change, to temperatures globally as cold as about 8 degrees centigrade than we have today. At that time, about 20,000 years ago, with just an 8 degrees centigrade drop of temperature throughout the planet, on average, mean, uh, it was enough to grow large ice sheets in places like North, uh, North America. Maine, this building would have been covered by two or three thousand foot ice sheet at that time. To get to that stage took about 90,000 years of gradual cooling. Once the glaciers got to their maximum extent, largely because of, no, because of solar activity, because of uh, absorption of greenhouse gases in the ocean, uh, there was a dramatic warming that took several thousand years. We had assumed to that point that was the fastest climate could change, and then we went into the last 10,000 years during which civilization has emerged, in which it was assumed the change was very small. Now, why did I belabor that fact? Because if, in fact, this was true, it's not now, but if it was true, it would mean that climate change is very slowly, and therefore, anything you do to the climate system couldn't possibly have an impact for thousands and thousands of years. And as much as we all care about what will happen to our children and our grandchildren, if somebody said that pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere will change the climate in 10,000 years, I don't think many of us would care. That, however, is not the story. Again, with that record, we found out that the climate system could change very, very quickly. That there could be a massive several degree centigrade changes dramatic changes in storms, 
dramatic changes in precipitation occurring in less than one to two years and being set in that pattern for hundreds, if not thousands of years. This graph shows you the behavior of those rapid or abrupt changes in temperature. This one shows you the abrupt changes in atmospheric circulation, storm patterns. So all of a sudden, the world changed. Things could happen much faster than we thought. Question is, how do these events occur? Well, they have an awful lot to do with atmospheric circulation, and in particular, they have to do with the jet stream. And if you take a look at this plot over here, the upper blue line running across the northern part of North America is the position of the jet stream, that air mass that takes air from the west, takes it towards the east in the summertime. It's the age of what is now popularly termed the polar vortex, the polar cell. It's the dividing line between cold air to the north, warm air to the south. In the winter, that whole front moves significantly farther south. And this is, of course, controlled by our position relative to the sun and all the things that have been set into, into, uh, into play over billions of years. However, we found out that these things could switch very, very quickly, that you could have sustained summer conditions for maybe not just two months, but maybe five months, sustained winter conditions for not three months, but maybe 10 months. And this all had to do with the other factors that were changing in the climate system. And if we take a look at the ones that I showed you before that could actually help to trigger this abrupt climate change, they're all of the ones that have the red stars on them. So basically, combinations of natural forcings in the climate could come together, sometimes a couple of them together, to create just that right situation, the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. The natural causes of abrupt climate change. So, before we talk about humans, how small a change is an important change. You all have an extremely good idea about how small a change is important, because you can go to one area, a square mile, which has been devastated by a tornado, or a massive storm and realize that if you were averaged that out over the state of Maine, it would of course be nothing, but it has a dramatic impact on the people who live there. So if we go back with these records and see how small the change could actually have an impact, again, the, the data is only generalized here, but we go from 10,000 years ago to the present, zero roughly, we find out that there are two prime examples of when atmospheric circulation patterns shifted dramatically. This is important because the atmosphere transports moisture, and one of them occurred around 4,200 years ago within a space of a few years. An entire city had to move because it was too close to the desert. And if the circulation systems move a little bit farther north, therefore the moisture source moves farther north. And the same thing happened about 1,100 years ago. This one in Central America, this one in modern day Syria, Iraq, uh, Turkey, all of the places which have, not necessarily Turkey, but all of the places which in the last few years have become extremely sensitive uh, geopolitically because they no longer have water, because farmers can no longer farm here, and this made it right for things like Arab Spring and all of the other aftermath of the Arab Spring. If you take a look at the best models created by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, these reddish and orange areas are the areas that are expected to experience significant drought uh, in the next few decades. And what we were able to do is to demonstrate that in this area, and certainly in this area, small shifts in climate, abrupt <laughs> shifts in climate, operating in less than one to two years, could have a great effect. So let's look at the other end of the spectrum, see what happens when it gets colder much faster. 
And for that example, we turn to Greenland, and it turns out that about 1000 AD, Eric the Red decided, actually was forced out of Iceland, uh, made his way to the coast of Greenland at a relatively mild time. According to this plot, it's when there was very little sea ice in the North Atlantic, meaning it was relatively warm. And within the next 400 years, the cathedrals, the culture, everything, that was brought by the Vikings to west and east coast of Greenland disappeared in a matter of a few years. It happened because sea ice extent was significantly greater, fast, and they could no longer be resupplied as they had been in the past uh, from Europe. So, are there small changes? For example, just a few kilometers shift in air masses or and or localized area it's not what happens over the entire planet globally, or I should say mean, uh, but it's what happens in individual areas that, of course, is important. So, have humans impacted the climate system? Well, this is a very uh, a well-used plot. We've now actually extended it back uh, to about uh, one million years ago, and we know that for CO2, the thing the greenhouse gas that, of course, is, has been popularized so much because it tracks a considerable amount of heat close to the surface of the Earth. We have, in the last few decades, exceeded values uh, during warm times and cold times uh, of at least the last 800,000, if not a million years. Now, that's very important. Uh, obviously, levels never got higher than about 280 or 290. 2013, we got up to 400. The expectation is that we'll get up to 900 by the year 2100, but I would suggest that that's actually not necessarily the most important thing. Because what's most important is the fact that the rate has accelerated so fast. Just in the last few decades, the levels of CO2 have risen 100 times faster than they have at least in the last million years, and therefore CO2 which was, as part of the natural climate variability, is suddenly being super stressed. Uh, it's as if you put CO2 on speed. It isn't just CO2, uh, it's also methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, which impact the amount of ozone. So greenhouse gases, acid rain, toxic metals, organic acids, and all of the rest that you can read here have all been dramatically intensified at tremendous rates and magnitudes in, to be very general, the last 150 years, but it's probably closer to the last 100 years. Sorry, I was standing in front of that. Uh, this plot shows you how much the levels of all of these things have increased in the last 150 years relative to the last 5,000 years. But I only made it the last 5,000 years because you wouldn't see any change at all if I put it over the true uh, perspective, and the true perspective is more like a million years. These increases are unsurpassed in the last million years. So the way we have evolved as humans, which is very much dependent on our water quality, our air quality, the temperatures that we live in, the precipitation patterns that we're exposed to, things are very different now in the last few decades than they've been in the last at least million years. We've no doubt evolved differently. So what is it that humans have done to the natural climate forcing components that can create abrupt climate change? Because if the change for the future is going to be a linear change, then you can sort of guess what's going to happen and you're going to have a lot of years potentially to prepare for it. If it's an abrupt change, which is a plausible scenario, and I'll show you that one has already happened, a plausible scenario, then how are we in fact making this abrupt change? One I already described. Uh, one is the fact that CO2 levels have risen 100 times faster than they have in the last million years. The next one, is the increase in methane. Methane is 30 to 60 times more capable of absorbing heat than CO2. 
and methane release is occurring all around us. It occurs from pipelines. It occurs uh, related to the extraction of natural gases. But the biggest potential source is the melting of permafrost in the Arctic. Uh, and as we open up the Arctic more and more, more and more permafrost will be released. None of the climate models take into account what will happen to methane in the future because nobody knows how much methane will be released. They can guess, but nobody actually knows. Next, the emission of dusts. Dusts at one level in the atmosphere track heat. Dust at a higher level in the atmosphere actually reflects incoming heat. Uh, the next, in these dotted lines, are secondary effects from warming and or cooling. You can change the amount of heat uh, that is transported through the ocean, or you can change the existence of ice on the planet by melting it, uh, by exposing it to warmer water, and as a consequence, change the whiteness of the surface. And once you uncap the Arctic Ocean or the Southern Ocean from sea ice, you release more heat. The other thing that humans have been effective in is actually operating the same way the sun does. When the sun changes climate, it does so through energy bursts that come out on the solar cycle, and those energy bursts actually impact the amount of ozone that we have high up 10, 20 miles up in the atmosphere. That ozone protects us from incoming radiation. If you take all of that ozone and pack it together, it would be a layer of ozone that thick that protects us from much of uh, the energy that comes from the sun in these bursts every few years. So it uh, turns out that we've actually destroyed the ozone hole in small segments throughout the Arctic, but in the Antarctic, we've created a very large ozone hole. It only lasts for six months a year. We've created it because we've been destroying ozone through the production of aerosol uh, chlorine, fluorine, uh, CFCs, and it changes the temperature gradient between the poles and the equator, and I'll show you in a few minutes why that's important. So, what are the health impacts to humans and ecosystems of all of these changes that we've produced? Uh, I call this the toxic climate cocktails. It's depressing when you think about it, but it's important to know about it. I know that many people in this room work on some of these things. One, of course, is warming. Warming creates vector-borne diseases, Lyme tick, is a classic example. We've been able to extrapolate how far Maine, uh, Lyme tick will expand in Maine as a consequence of the fact that it is directly related to the number of warm versus cold days that exist. Um, at the same time, uh, warming changes where atmospheric circulation patterns go. I'll give you more detail in a minute, which can create drought, collapse of the Mesopotamian Empire, modern day uh, Syria. Uh, floods, storms, all created by where atmospheric circulation patterns go, how fast they move, how intense they are. Respiratory disease, we have tons of particularly small particles that we put into the atmosphere. In fact, in general, the U.S. has relatively lungs prevent you from breathing and may be one of the dramatic contributors to the high levels of asthma. Uh, neurological diseases, cancer, there are all sorts of nasty, toxic substances out there. One that tends to be uh, high throughout the United States is cadmium. It's emitted as a consequence of industrial activity, and cadmium is not the only cause of autism in children, but it certainly contributes to autism in children, as demonstrated by the Heinz Foundation uh, endowments that we've worked with. And then, of course, ecosystem upheaval, ocean acidification, deoxygenation, tons of our food uh, comes from the ocean. We have polluted the ocean with mercury. Now, this isn't to say that we don't know about some of these things, uh, but I think we don't necessarily almost think about them as being a component of climate change. So, EPA has collected a phenomenal assembly of data, uh, very high quality data, uh, that allows you to look at uh, carbon monoxide, large particulates, small particulates, ozone, this is ground level ozone, the pollutant, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, heavy metals, 
uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and then other pollutants, uh, things like um, dioxins, uh, etc., PCBs. We've taken all of that data in our institute and put it together in something called 10 Green. It, uh, it's a system in which you just put a zip code in or a location, and it allows you with one number to tell how healthy your air quality is. We chose air versus water and food. Water and food can, are without a doubt potentially contaminated, but you can eat clean food if you try or spend the money. You can certainly drink clean water if you're very careful. You cannot escape air. Air is everywhere we all breathe it. So what we did was to put together a series of, as you go deeper and deeper into 10 green, uh, you find out how over time, the green, which are the healthy values, have or have not increased in the area you're looking at. You find out how the red values, which are bad, have hopefully leveled out or flattened out. And you find out which measurements in the past were not taken, meaning the gray ones, and then whether or not they are being done now. So when the gray dies out, that means all of these measurements are made. We can show you with 10 green uh, all of the sites in the United States. It's only available for the US. US is amazing. We're the only country that shares this sort of data. All of the sites where this information is available and you can compare your number, your 10 green number to other parts of the country. So I keep talking about atmospheric circulation. Atmospheric circulation is critically important because the atmosphere transports pollutants, temperature, precipitation. And the thing that drives atmospheric circulation is the difference in temperature from one part of the planet to another. Greenhouse gas warming in the last 15 years relative to the previous 15 years, along with natural climate variability, but dominated by greenhouse gas warming, has made the high latitudes of the northern hemisphere much warmer than they would have been. The red, uh, interestingly, places like the Southern Ocean have gotten cooler. I'll tell you why briefly in a minute. But in general, the northern hemisphere has been much more impacted because it's continent and it heats up more easily. The ocean absorbs a great deal of this heat. The most dramatic event in the last few years, for that matter, you'll find out in a long period of time, is the opening up of the uh, Arctic sea ice, first projected to happen by 2050, then by 2025, then by 2015, and literally, as they were releasing the report that said it would happen by 2015, it happened in about 2008. I'll talk about the consequences of this. Uh, and when you heat up the Arctic by latitudes, by, re by removing summer sea ice from only certain some areas, not all areas, you release more heat, you change the surface color of the ocean from white to dark, therefore it absorbs, uh, it absorbs heat, but also re-radiates that heat. We know that the rest of the northern hemisphere in general has been warming. When you put warm in the poles against warm in the mid-latitudes, what you do is you flatten the temperature gradient, and when you flatten the temperature gradient, those winds that go from west to east get weaker. And as they get weaker, that's the blue, they allow more air to go, warm air to go north, and more cold air to go south. Those westerly winds act as a barrier between the cold high latitudes, the warmer mid to low latitudes. It's critically important. When they get weak, you get a lot more transfer back and forth. You look at Antarctica, just for a moment, the ozone hole in Antarctica has had a critical impact because in the southern hemisphere, that lack of, of ozone, only for a few weeks, has resulted in a small loss of heat over a place that's super cold already. It doesn't matter, it's getting colder. And we have, in general, warming uh, in portions of the southern hemisphere, but the net result is we have a steeper temperature gradient, very cold to warm, 
the net result is these westerly winds become much, much stronger. The north-south exchange of air gets weaker, and the net result is you create a barrier around Antarctica that prevents warm air from entering Antarctica. And these strong winds, as they blow across the Southern Ocean, bring up cold water, which is why the Southern Ocean is temporarily cooling, and that cold air fortunately absorbs a certain amount of CO2. How much, we don't know in the future. So we've been working all over the world, these red dots, to study changes in atmospheric circulation systems where the westerlies have gone and other air masses. And in many ways, this story and a lot of what's happened to us over the last two to three to four years is about the jet stream. So now I'll begin to focus more on the jet stream in the northern hemisphere and make my way to Maine. As, I should have backed up here. If you take a look at this, uh, I guess not. If you take a look at that animation, I went through too quickly, you would see that there are times when the jet stream pushes its way considerably farther south than normal. Why would that happen? It happens because the westerlies, that barrier, is very weak. The weaker that barrier gets, the more warm air goes to the north, the more cold air gets to the south. The summer sea ice in the Arctic may be melting, but there's still a lot of cold air up there, relatively. And as it turns out, the longer, the more embayed, that pattern, based on colleagues at Rutgers, Francis, and Vavarus, they've demonstrated that the longer that low, the more slowly it moves, which is potentially why we get locked into these patterns on a fairly regular basis, and why they tend to last that long. So, what does it matter if the jet stream dips down uh, farther south than normal and has that pattern? This, these maps come from what uh, software routine that was developed by Sean Burkle in our institute. He'll be speaking after lunch today. It's a remarkable program. I, I encourage you to stop in for at least a couple of minutes, or obviously many other good talks too. But if you take a look at Climate Reanalyzer, one example of what it does, this is a snapshot of one day this last winter, but in fact it applied to everything for the last two winters and much of the winter uh, days going back to 2012. And if you look at air temperature, blue and purple mean cold. Look at that. That pattern of the jet stream moving down was bringing an immense amount of cold air down. If you take a look at the rest of the hemisphere, in general, it's red and orange, meaning that it has been warmer surrounding this cold tongue of air relatively than it's been for those for that period of the winter in the past. You look at sea surface temperature, the Arctic Ocean has been warmer, and in fact, the Gulf of Maine has been warmer. And if you look at where precipitable water, moisture available for storms goes, it's making its way farther north in the Pacific, because it scoots up around the coast and around that cold air as the jet stream moves farther north. And in a place like Maine, it also scoots up around the outside of this cold air mass, providing a lot of precipitation, which is exactly what you need when cold and warm air masses come together to create storms. So let's take a look at how things in that, in that system have changed, not just over a day, but over, in this particular case, the period back to 1975. And what you will see is that for the entire hemisphere, experience in the last roughly 30 years, a little less than a one degree centigrade rise in temperature. Variability because of natural processes, but a very definite gradient. If you look at the Arctic, a bit more shocking, Variability, but over the last 30 years, a three degree centigrade rise, which is big. And if you look at the northeast of the United States, there has been arguably from sort of minimum to maximum about a two degree centigrade rise. But So there's a bit of a slope here, but there's been tremendous variability. Very cold periods, very warm periods, has a lot to do with the shape of this feature here. And just imagine, 
you're talking about the high latitudes, which are most greatly affected, and they're impinging. They're beginning to tell the story down into the lower, uh, into the lower latitudes. So, how might climate change in the future? First thing, just before we leave the Arctic, this is the warming of the Arctic in roughly the last five to ten years. It has risen eight degrees Fahrenheit, which means that in the Arctic, the summer is now twice as long as it was five to ten years ago. That's big, very, very big. Not here, but in the Arctic, which impacts us. And based on the best we can tell, this is the most dramatic change in the last 12,000 years. And because it happened in less than a few years, it's an abrupt climate change. So to think about the climate operating in this linear fashion is unrealistic. It can make jumps depending on where you are, and those jumps can impact other latitudes. These are the sorts of things that have been a consequence of Arctic warming. Not 100%, but if I had to give you a number, 75%, 80%. And if you knew to some degree, to a large degree of certainty, what the stock market would do within 75 to 80%, I'd be pretty happy. So, what sort of an impact does this have uh, on natural, quote unquote, uh, catastrophes? Uh, quite dramatic if you look at insurance returns. Swiss Re and Munich Re are the two largest insurance companies in the world. They insure the insurance companies. They worry an awful lot about what they pay out. And if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, which is the upper plot here, very obvious trend in the payout, not only because population is increasing, more people, most people live on the coast, therefore storms are impacting them, and these are largely storm events. You look at the southern hemisphere, there's a bit of a slope, but pretty mild. So the northern hemisphere, and these are all normalized dollars, the northern hemisphere is being dramatically impacted uh, by increased frequency of storms. It's a great way to integrate over the entire northern hemisphere, the effect of climate change. What do we have in store for the future? As we begin to, uh, as we look at the northern hemisphere where the westerlies are weakening, there's going to be more warm air making its far, way farther north, uh, red, cold air going farther south. It will leave some areas that did have water in the past, like the Middle East example, uh, in drought. Other places, interestingly enough, like the summer the Indian monsoon will probably be pushed farther north than it normally is. In the southern hemisphere, the same, the, the story is different because the exchange of warm and cold air is not so great. Places like Mali, and Mali may not seem to have a great deal of significance to, to Maine, but it has tremendous geopolitical significance, as does Somalia, the Middle East, and a place like Mali, which is right in here, you take a look at the average, annual average precipitation in Mali over the, uh, the period 1979 to 2002. White means no precipitation. Only the lower fifth of Mali gets any precipitation. It's about one meter. If you take a look at what's happened in the last 10 years, that lower portion of Mali has lost half of its precipitation. It's a landlocked country. Uh, the people have to go someplace when they have no water. Uh, other things are emerging. Other landlocked countries, uh, Tajikistan and Lesotho, happen to be the water towers for their area. Lesotho, in the midst of South Africa's drying, is very, very high, holds a lot of precipitation. Tajikistan has the largest mass of ice outside of the polar regions and it's completely surrounded by Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, China, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Iran, all of these countries that are dry. So you can only guess what's going to happen as the drought continues. Oops. So, next, how much could sea level rise? Uh, we and many other people have been looking at small glaciers all over the planet. We know they're getting smaller. We know that portions of Greenland are melting, Arctic summer sea ice is gone, and we know that the northern portions of Antarctica are beginning to melt. One of the reasons that not much has happened 
much farther inland is because the westerlies are protecting Antarctica from having warm air entering. So how much could sea level rise? You look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a phenomenal document put together uh, by many countries, a diverse array of disciplines. They look, they have a, but they do, they do abide to the least common denominator. So they're very conservative in their thinking, very broad in their scope, but very conservative in their thinking. And what they suggest is that by 2100, there will be a quarter of a meter to about a one meter rise in temperature by 2100. <clears throat> Since that report came out in 2013, it turns out that there is much more ice melting. And there's another estimate of a little bit more, well, a little bit less than a meter and a half uh, by 2100. 2100 is obviously not that far away, particularly when you're thinking about protecting cities. Uh, if you, however, take a look at the geological record, and you go back millions of years, you have to go back to 130,000 years ago before you see a two degree centigrade rise in temperature. Even IPCC, which is a remarkable document, but relatively conservative, they suggest that by 2100, there will be a two to three degree centigrade change. And what did that do? The last time, 130,000 years ago, when two degrees centigrade, of, when the temperature was two degrees C higher than today, it rose sea level four to six meters, 12 to 18 feet uh, for a two degree centigrade rise. If you go and look for the last time the temperature was three degrees centigrade higher, sea level was 20 to 30 meters higher, 60 to 90 feet higher than it is today for still a conservative estimate. So the big question, of course, is could all of this happen by 2100? Most likely, no. However, things can happen faster than we sometimes assume they will. And again, looking at the geologic record, there was a time period when the massive ice sheets melted 14 and a half thousand years ago when sea level rose at the rate of 13 feet per 100 years. Is that going to happen by 2100? No, but I'll guarantee you that we will get several feet, certainly by 2300, 2400. Easy for me to say, I guess. You can take my word for it, by 2300. But <laughs> it will. It, it almost definitely will. And when you build or move, when you build a dam, when you move a city, you are not doing that for the next 50 to 80 years. You're doing it for what you expect to happen over the next two to three hundred years. Cities last a long time. So for broad scale thinking outside the box in plausible scenarios, think about several feet. And then what is climate change today in particular for Maine? Well, in 2009 we came out, our institute and, and several colleagues, with Maine's climate future, an initial assessment the first report ever done solely for an individual state. Recently, we came out this year with an update to that report. Lots happened, we know more, we have a better idea of what the trajectories are. You can download this from our website, just look at Climate Change Institute, go to the home site, the, the web page, and you can download the PDF. And what did we find out? I, I'll summarize very quickly some of the things we found in Sean Burkle, in the next set of presentations, we'll talk in even more detail. We found out that, just looking at the existing uh, record, uh, that temperatures uh, projected for 2030 to 2054 are believed to be about three times faster in rise than they've been in the last 125 years. So we've already experienced an increase of three degrees Fahrenheit, potentially. Uh, since about 1890, we'll have three times as much change based on the models uh, by 2035 to 2054. If you take a look at uh, extreme heating days, which are critically important, obviously, to Maine, uh, particularly for older populations, uh, we should expect by the 2050s to see two times more the number of days when the temperature exceeds 95 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Uh, in terms of precipitation, we should see by 2035 to 2050 as much of a rise in precipitation as we had in the previous roughly 120 years. So an accelerated rate of precipitation. If you take a look at snowfall, a little hard to imagine this year, but the projections tell us that snowfall should decrease slightly, but of course it'll come in the form of rain. Whether or not that turns out to be true has an awful lot to do with what happens in the Arctic. If we continue to get these cold blasts of air coming down, it'll stay in the form of snow at least several years out of the decade. And places like the Gulf of Maine, which is already arguably the or close to the fastest warming uh, water body, ocean body on the planet, uh, will continue to warm. And if you take a look at the return in this particular case in the form of lobsters, uh, there's already been a migration of lobster, well, the lobster industry from Rhode Island to Massachusetts to southern Maine, and now it's largely centered around central Maine and farther to the east. As temperatures rise, there'll be no doubt a change here. And it's not necessarily because the lobsters don't like warmer waters, it's because the things that attack the lobsters do better in warmer waters. So how much of this is natural uh, and how much of this is human? Clearly, I've been proposing that most of the, of the rise is human, but this is another way of looking at it. Uh, this is temperature from 1850 uh, to 2000. This turns out to be uh, northern hemisphere temperature. And the red is the actual data. And the gray is what you get when you use only the natural forcings of climate without accelerating them at all, just projecting what would have happened had we not seen these changes in the last few decades. And the match is not as good as if you add in the accelerated increase in, uh, in greenhouse gases and all of the other things that we've done. It's that had we not accelerated greenhouse gas rise, uh, that the climate would have looked more like this. It would have stayed relatively flat, and we would have still been in that climate that was experienced, that, that ended the, the Viking op occupation of Greenland, the so-called Little Ice Age. We would have been experiencing relatively cooler temperatures had it not been for the rise in greenhouse gases. How good are the climate models? This is a paper written by a colleague in Germany. It goes from 1975 to today, the plots. This is sea level, that's temperature, that's CO2. What this particular fellow, Stefan Ramsdorf, did was to take a look at what the models were predicting in 1975. And the date, the plots on here, the light line, which you probably cannot see, is the actual data. The solid lines are the projections. And basically, they got the trends spot on. They just didn't get the slope right. Things have accelerated much faster than expected. So these models are good. They tell you the right direction. They don't necessarily tell you the magnitude, and they don't tell you if there are going to be bumps along the way, like abrupt climate change. So the question is, when we plan for the future, are we using uh, plausible scenarios? Uh, one view is everything happens linearly. Another is that there might be this rather steep but gradual change. Another is that we'll experience a series of bumps as we go along. These are all plausible scenarios. And in your thinking about what will happen in the next 20 to 30 years, it's important to take this sort of thinking into account. What would happen if what is projected for 2100 happened in one small part of Maine? Not all of it, just one small part of it. Could that happen? Of course it could. Right now, Boston, Massachusetts is thinking very seriously about what happened with Hurricane Sandy. Because if Hurricane Sandy had hit Boston, Massachusetts, the entire region of Harvard and MIT would have been flooded right up to, uh, right, right through the first floor. It's all uh, very close to or below sea level. A storm surge alone would have a dramatic impact. And what have we learned, or what, I, what have I tried to suggest here? Uh, humans have dramatically impacted the rate of warming through natural processes. 
These changes in the past and as a consequence of human activity can happen in less than a political cycle, very fast. Greenhouse gases and ozone depletion, exactly the way the natural climate system operates, is what we have largely perturbed. All right, for the Northern Hemisphere, particularly for Eastern North America, what's happening in the Arctic right now, that big, abrupt climate change is critically important uh, because it has redistributed moisture, heat, and pollutants via shifts in atmospheric circulation. So, the military, the Pentagon, has thought about this for several years. Not everybody else has caught up with this idea. We've also been proposing it for a long time, and we believe it's critically true. Despite the fact that you don't hear a lot about climate change when it comes to elections, climate change is a critically important security issue. It affects our health, which I tried to demonstrate, our economy, which I haven't talked about, but of course where we, where we get our oil, how we extract our, our energy. I did talk about the frequency of so-called natural disasters, catastrophes, impacted by shifts in atmospheric circulation patterns, and there are classic examples of geopolitical implications. Opening of the Arctic Ocean, sea ice in the summer, uh, many countries are vying for this. Uh, what's happening in, with the Arab Spring, a variety of examples. So, when you think about climate, and climate change, a whole bunch of terminology jumps up. Things that jump up are uh, mitigation, adaptation, uh, opportunity, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. And we're in the process of trying to put together a way in which we can take our out-of-the-box thinking, which we believe has great validity, but uh, obviously uh, nonlinear thinking is not necessarily the only way the world operates. And one of the things that we did was to have a conference in October uh, called Climate Adaptation and Sustainability Conference. We got people together from all planets, from all over the state. Some of you in this room might have attended. And we started to find, wanted to find out what are the vulnerabilities in a place like Maine. Obviously, coast sea, uh, sea level rise, uh, impact of extreme events on uh, drainage systems, sewers, fresh water, invasive species, on and on and on. So we collected a large list of these things, put together some existing case examples of what those impacts mean, how in some parts of the world people have dealt with this, and we're now in the process of developing something that we call the Climate Futures Framework. Uh, Homeland Security is doing something very, very similar, doing a remarkable job for the Casco Bay area. We're trying to do the same sort of thing, except apply, apply it to a much broader area. We're great believers in the fact that individuals and communities are the peop those are the places that people know their vulnerabilities the best. They know where the road is going to flood if there's a storm. They know which parts of their sewer system are more susceptible to the age of it. So, but what people need is transparent information. So we've put together software, this one called Climate Reanalyzer, that allows you to see how the climate has changed in the past, how it changes now, and what the projections are for the future. We've put together this air quality app, and we're now putting together a series of layers that depend upon uh, geographic information systems, except you don't have to go out and buy the program. We've made public layers. You can go to your community, see where the, um, where the, uh, how the, what the plants are like, uh, what the relief is like, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're in the process of collecting more and more information about vulnerabilities, along with case examples. Uh, we are plugging in what we believe are plausible scenarios about rates of change, everything from slow linear, uh, to abrupt, and then we're in the process of trying to develop a system, a framework, in which people can plug all of this information in and develop plausible scenarios at the community, the state, the national, and we hope the international level. Again, if you want to hear more about climate, you can analyze with Sean Burkle. So, what's, what's the purpose of all this? You know, as well as I do, it's to protect people but it is also to look for opportunities in the future. And there are opportunities in the future. By making sure we are concerned with our air quality, how the climate will change, we will end up with uh, cleaner air. If you clean the air up for cadmium and small particulates, you will also reduce greenhouse gases whether you want to or not. 
so you reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, we have great opportunities in this state for renewable energy uh, and energy independence and better jobs. Uh, we have opportunities because of the fact that the Arctic Ocean is opening up, at least in the summertime, we are already being considered the East Coast version of Alaska, and Senator King is now the junior Arctic senator uh, for the Senate, uh, because we could very well be the gateway to Europe and also the East. And uh, we have strong potential if we utilize our renewable resources, which are all over the place, in terms of solar, uh, Germany uh, ha has about 30 to 40 percent of their energy, I believe, that comes from renewable. And we live at a, at a much more uh, a friendlier latitude than Germany does for solar power, despite the fact that it seems great. Maine actually does receive a lot of solar power. What do you do with all that solar power? You sell it, but you can also use it for organic farming, which is becoming more and more popular. We need to, of course, think about energy efficiency. We have tremendous natural resources. We have a growing, we will have, I shouldn't say we do, we will have a growing population. This is the place that people will come. There will be an immense amount of in-migration. Because although we do have storms, we're not going to have drought, uh, and we have relatively clean air. And the thing that we have that so many places doesn't have, don't have, that leads to tremendous amounts of displacement is ton uh, our moose. No. <laughs> so, just to, find, uh, to finish up, are we doing uh, as good a job as we can of informing the public and policy makers? You certainly have the opportunity to do that. You do it all the time, and all of your acts do that. In terms of the scientific community, we're trying to find more and more ways to do this. Uh, do we all understand the important impacts? People only will only care about climate change, not because it might happen in 2100, but because of what's happening today. They need to understand that their health and their wealth is directly related to things that are happening as a consequence of climate change today, and that humans play a very dramatic role in this. And do we have all of the climate services, support, etc., that we need to deal with these things? That's exactly what this meeting is about. Thank you very much for inviting me.